is inherently multi-vendor. There is no way a single vendor has a monopoly in innovation. So how do we apply this to healthcare is the question. And what we believe is that for this to work, it actually has to be based on common data. Because this integration in the ERP world is a little bit simpler. The data is simpler and it's not as long lived as in healthcare. But in the healthcare world, this actually has to be underpinned by a common data model in order for this to be efficient and in order for this to work. And, you know, Gartner plays around with this bimodal IT, which I firmly believe is the right way to go. So you have the core, which is mode one, a team that keeps the business running. And then you have the mode two, a very different team with very different skills, goals, and uh, methods that actually is the agile world where they can bring solutions quickly. And if you look at back to this slide, it's actually the mode one in the middle and mode two around the edge. What's also interesting is that finally, uh, Gartner from their uh, uh, interviews with a lot of uh, companies in, in all industries is starting to see the shift of the budget from just the core to actually, uh, they're claiming 50% in 2020 to the innovation. And this is really important because as we know, without the shift of budget, uh, we're only dreaming. So going into healthcare, we already know that we have pretty much systems like this. We have a core. We already have different systems uh, in place anyway, like the radiology, like uh, pharmacy, theater, labs, and so on. But what we fail to realize a lot of times is how many other applications we have. Now, when Andy says 190, you think that's a lot. But you would be surprised. Guys in St. Thomas claims they have 7,500. Gosh has about 500. I mean, these are big numbers. And I don't even think the problem is the ones you know about, but the ones you don't know about, <laughs> right? So uh, May 25th, GDPR, right? A patient can walk in and say, give me all my data or delete all my data. How do you do that if you don't even know what applications you have, right? So this is a huge problem. And one solution which we are proposing actually is what uh, the path that uh, uh, Andy is taking is actually to start with one application. Now, in Plymouth's case, that's OpenEP. One application which they didn't have among those 190. They needed it badly. They chose a solution, but at the same time, they set the stage for the uh, integrated care record, uh, as Andy mentioned in the previous presentation. Now, of course, the idea is then that you could, with time, move the other applications over. Now, by move, I don't mean you can just move. You actually have to probably rewrite a lot of them, hopefully a new technology. And our mission is to build tools to make this as easy as possible and as quick as possible. And hopefully, by building this type of an ecosystem, we hope that the industry will engage and provide these solutions especially now that we have real customers wanting to pay money for these solutions, which was not the case four or five years ago. Okay, so this is what we call the postmodern EHR. Again, it's a bimodal world. We have a core that needs to keep running, at least for the foreseeable future. But we try to move the data, the health data, clinical data, over to an open system and then build the new applications uh, on top of this and hopefully with time being able to acquire the new solutions that already comply with this architecture. Now, at the GUI level, of course, what uh, C-Air is doing is actually joining the two for the user so that actually the user experience is, uh, is, is one. But at the data level, I think this type of architecture will be there for, for a while. Now, this brings us to health data, right? And I said before, most applications, and this is true in all industries, keep data in proprietary formats. It's a business model issue. It's not many times, it's not even technical. They know that it would be better to use the accepted data models or even the shared data models, but their business depends on locking the customer in, okay? So again, it's true in all industries. The, the trouble we have in healthcare is that we really want to have this data for a very long time ideally for the lifetime of the patient. That's 100 years. 
So what we end up doing is we end up migrating from one proprietary format to another every time we switch applications because no application will last 100 years. We'll be switching this at least five to seven times during the lifetime of the data. Now, as Andy said, a lot of times this is too expensive. We just keep it running, but that's not interoperability. That doesn't solve any problem. So again, as was mentioned several times, the PAX is in a different world. For 20 years, nobody's storing images in proprietary formats. Documents with CDA or even just a PDF can be stored in a vendor neutral format shared by many applications and produced by many applications. But the structured data, where most of the value is, because that's what you, you need to run the AI, the algorithms, the clinical decision support, that's still largely kept in the silos. And this is what OpenEHR does. <coughs> Just like the images and the documents, it takes the structured data out of applications and makes sure it's available to many applications from different vendors. Okay? Now, the architecture at the high level that we get is something like this, right? Three types of data, some common services, mostly based on IHE profiles, like the master patient index, provider registries. There's a lot of stuff in the middle, the, the, uh, the service bus. Uh, but then we expose APIs on top of which others can build applications. And they can be, of course, clinician facing or patient facing, it doesn't matter. So after, uh, I guess, almost three years or, or even more of pressuring Gartner to actually admit this, and you can imagine there were other people pressuring them not to admit it, uh, Gartner produced this statement in a research paper in February of last year. And it says clearly that in order to do this, to be ready for the future, you actually have to persist in a vendor neutral format. Because what the industry will tell you is, why don't we just keep the data where it is, interface it with messaging or fire APIs, which is the new version of that, and we can just use it when we need it, right? <coughs> but as Andy pointed out, if you have blood pressure in five applications, right, uh, in different formats, even using the same API, how will you make sure that you can trust that data? Okay. I think what you need to do is normalize as soon as possible. Okay. And we'll talk about the data structures uh, later and see what kind of problems can appear. But it's safe to say that most systems, even within the same system, have data in different places, the same data, the same type of data. So I think somebody's mentioned that Epic has 80,000 tables. Okay, so this is the magnitude of this problem. But finally, Gartner is starting to say that the architecture, VNA for images, OpenEHR for structured data, and XDS for documents, uh, is something that you need if you want to take advantage uh, of, um, of uh, the open architecture. So this brings us to OpenEHR. And OpenEHR is not new. It's, uh, it's been around for um, at least 25 years. Uh, it came out of European projects and was mostly um, uh, uh, developed at UCL in London. Now, what is new is that we now have vendors actually taking this to the market uh, in a way that makes sense for customers, that provides value. Before, before, for 10 years, it was mostly an academic exercise. But the, 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 the foundation is very sound. And one of the key proponents of OpenEHR is that it separates content from technology. Now, since we're in the technology business, we understand that technology constantly changes. If you want to keep data for a very long time, you cannot tie the data to a particular technology. So that's the first reason. The second reason is that with a mix of technology and content, we get things like doctor's coding. Sorry, Ian. Right? Or we get things like IT people building clinical models. Both are wrong. Okay? And the history is full of projects that have been doing this. And we believe it's, it's fundamentally wrong. We should have clinicians building clinical models. And then software developers building systems based on those models. And this is what OpenEHR provides. Now, 
this is the core element called an archetype, a base model, in this case, case for blood pressure. What you immediately see is that it's not just systolic diastolic, right? It's also the context of this measurement. And this is what I said before. If you have this in five different systems and use a simple API to get data out, you will not get all the context. So imagine I send you a blood pressure of 120 over 80, but I don't tell you the person was under exertion. Can you interpret that data? Can you trust it? Right? <coughs> this is the problem. So we're able to store the context of the measurement, things like position, confounding factors, exertion, sleep status, tilt, whatever, uh, cuff size, the protocol, meaning the device which with which the measurement was taken, with the data itself. So when we move this data around, if we have to, we can provide the full fidelity of data, which lets you interpret systolic and diastolic in this case. And this is key. This is really key. So, of course, this is just one data element. Uh, I forgot to mention that uh, we also do things like translation here. We do validation. We say that uh, uh, systolic is, has a SNOMED code of this and this, or that uh, uh, it has a range of values. Uh, and this, again, is important. We do this at the model level, before writing a single line of code, which actually means that however I use this archetype, I will never be able to store data out of range, because the systems that implement this will not allow it. And I don't have to centrally manage this, I have to manage the models, but the use <coughs> can be widespread by different vendors, different technologies, different programming languages, <coughs> but the rules will be enforced when the data is about to be stored. Uh, for international use, of course, we also do translations at this level. Uh, Norway has done a really good job of making models available for the whole country. And we have a situation now where we have three, four of the largest vendors in the country using the same models. Uh, people that have 80% of the hospital market and people that will soon have about 70% of the primary care market. Now imagine that, right? So exchange of data becomes just a legal issue, not a technical issue anymore. So this is a blood pressure uh, archetype. We assemble these archetypes into something we call templates, and that's the two-level modeling concept. Because what happens? The archetype, as you can see, is actually universal. It describes the human condition. There is no reason why this is different anywhere in the world. Okay? Whereas the use case, which is called a template, is different. So we assemble the archetypes and add another layer called the template where we can customize for the use case while still storing data in the original archetype <laughs> format, the universal format. This gives us a lot of flexibility. We can adapt. As you can see, this then becomes the data model for a form. We can adapt to the different use case, like a GP visit, cardiologist encounter. They will want different detail, but the data will always be stored the same way. Okay. So what we get with OpenEHR is that all the layers of the software understand data the same way. Now think about classical applications. That's not the case. We have a relational data model. Then we have an object data model at the server level. Then we have an object uh, presentation layer data model. All of them are different. If we're lucky, we get the same validation. But we have to reformat this data every time, every tier of the software. So this does away with that. All the validation, all the translations are pushed all the way to the GUI if you do your software correctly. And you can actually trust that all the layers understand data the same way. So, what we need to do, of course, is to govern these models. And I mentioned the example of Norway, where at the national level, they have set the archetypes which are to be used inside Norway. They also set the terminologies. And standards bodies like OpenEHR or um, um, uh, IHTSDO are the right place for that. Then some uh, governments, regions, cities make sure that a template is also standardized. Like you would like a dis discharge summary to be the same from all your reporting hospitals. But after that, you leave it up to the vendors. They can make their own templates, use their tools to generate or build software. But as I said before, since all the, layer, all the arrows point in one direction, they cannot break the rules that you have set at the archetype level. And this is very important. 
it doesn't have to be centralized. Some people think, oh, we, we need to have one big uh, centralized uh, data store. No, we can have federated stores. As long as you're using the same models, it will fit together and will be validated the same way. So this is another quote by Gartner, uh, talking to CIOs about uh, the fact that it's time to take a look at this technology. But I'd like to um, end with, um, with some use cases and show you some examples through the use cases because I think that's the most important part of today. So we have um, quite a lot of presence around the world with the notable exception of the, um, the US. Uh, I mean, there's probably some stuff going on, but not that we know of. Uh, but a lot of the emerging markets have adapted this, adopted this technology because for them it's a no-brainer. They don't have a lot of legacy. Uh, they're usually centrally funded. So prescribing the way to do this is actually the easiest uh, solution. Uh, and we now have a lot of companies in this space as well. A lot of uh, uh, quite large companies like Medtronic, CGI was mentioned, um, University Hospital. I'll talk about uh, um, the Brazil uh, National Insurance and so on, cities. So we can break the use cases into these five categories. Now, you realize that health data, clinical data is everywhere in healthcare, right? It's in research, it's in registries, it's in EHRs, it's in uh, shared care records, uh, ecosystems, and so on. So we've broken it up into these, uh, these uh, five boxes and we have, I'll show you examples of each one. So the first one is somebody goes out and builds an EHR, right? And this is the example uh, that uh, we have in Slovenia where we have actually built an EHR <coughs> for a children's a pediatric hospital with about 220 beds. Uh, and actually this is the, the origin of, um, of uh, OpenEP as well because that's where we first introduced uh, meds management uh, in a closed loop system, enabling this hospital to achieve uh, MRAM stage six, <coughs> which is the requirement, uh, closed loop medication is a requirement for that. Uh, we use this to prove that it actually can be done and that all clinical data can be stored uh, in the open EHR methodology. Uh, and um, it was a journey. Um, and of course, today, what they can do is things like uh, what Andy mentioned, which with one single data source, it's much easier for them, them to do clinical decision support because they can trust the data being consistent, uh, uh, being all in one place for the single patient. Uh, we have other examples like um, Ayala Health, uh, it's a big conglomerate in the Philippines, which is running about 200 clinics, have built their own light EHR on top of the platform, run it on Amazon Cloud, uh, and are introducing affordable care to the Philippines, um, uh, expanding to 500 primary care centers, which they're also building. It's, it's a really interesting uh, project for the last three years. Um, I mentioned Norway. Uh, Patient Sky is a provider of primary care solutions in, uh, in Norway. Uh, they've been building for the last two years a platform, cloud-based platform for uh, primary care physicians, uh, which is really exciting. They will be launching in other markets end of this year. Uh, probably Sweden and uh, Denmark first, but they also want to come to the UK. Um, I don't have to talk about this one, but uh, <laughs> I talked about uh, the example of OpenEP being that one application which starts to put the right infrastructure in place. Um, CDR for government. So by government, it can be a city, it can be a region. Uh, we had um, a project five years ago which we were running for our national health uh, uh, ministry which actually said let's connect all healthcare institutions and Slovenia is about two million people with uh, I think we have 30 hospitals in about 90 primary care centers and about um, 2,000 GPs. So what we did was we connected everything using IHE and document exchange. And we did this because we could do this really quickly. In six months, we connected the whole country. Uh, but then what happened was, and I, I, I'm telling this because I see a lot of uh, the cities here trying to do this. Uh, and I think it's actually a really good idea, document-based exchange to start. But then what happened was the government came back and said, okay, we paid all this money, so tell us how many diabetics do we have, right? And from documents, that's really hard to do. 
it's really hard to do. So what we found is that, and this was six, seven years ago, what we found was we actually needed the structured data in that exchange. So what we started doing was attaching archetypes, basically, to the documents, discharge summaries, <coughs> ambulatory notes, uh, prescriptions that were coming out of the system. So now we have this architecture that you saw on the, on the, on the previous slides, where we have separate repository for images for the country, separate repository for documents based on XDS, IHE, and a separate repository for structured data based on OpenEHR. And after that, solutions like clinical registries or um, uh, the e-referral system or immunization registry, for instance, were really easy because the data was already there. They had somewhere to base the application embedded in different systems around the country and move really quickly by, uh, by uh, uh, building the shared care record for the citizens. Um, this is a new project which is just starting. Uh, Brazil, about five years ago, decided on open EHR. And due to their procurement, it's taken forever. <laughs> um, not unlike the NHS, actually. <laughs> um, so, but this will be the largest, the largest EHR in the world with about 220 million uh, patients. Uh, and it's a shared care record from the primary and the uh, hospital systems. And uh, they want to do that, use this to, uh, to influence policy, to uh, help with uh, things like uh, um, outbreak reporting. Uh, you know, they had the Zika uh, problem with the maternity uh, numbers, uh, um, infant mortality, things like this at the national level. So the next example is clinical registries. And uh, one of the key customers here is Eurotransplant, which is uh, covering the um, uh, exchange of organs uh, between uh, uh, 12 European countries, uh, matching donors and recipients. Uh, and the problem they had was quite interesting. They, they do this for five organ groups, but they had five different applications. So now a patient comes in that needs two uh, transplants, uh, and they had a really hard time matching this. So They've re-architected, they now have a single store, but they still have different applications on top. Okay. So that's the idea. And we're now expanding this into um, remote monitoring of uh, heart transplant, one of the, of the uh, transplantations that they do, uh, with an application that's going to be used at the sites. And it's about 150 hospitals across Europe uh, that are part of the Eurotransplant heart uh, transplant program. <laughs> Uh, where the doctors will be able to order what the patient has to do at home, and then the patient will use a home device uh, with, uh, with uh, um, monitoring of um, even the ECG or uh, the, the simple stuff like body weight, temperature, uh, do some basic tests like the six-minute walk and so on, and real-time report back to the clinicians so that the clinicians in these monitoring centers will actually have a way of figuring out what's going on. Now, we chose this uh, use case because the transplant patients are really serious patients, so they will be doing this for sure. Okay. Uh, sometimes the problem you have with, with these scenarios is that the patients don't comply and then you have a lot of issues. But here we expect to get a lot of uh, uh, data uh, from this. And of course, it will be in the same format that Eurotransplant <coughs> uses in the registries, so it will be very easy to report uh, the outcomes after one, five, and, uh, and 10 years. Um, clinical research, uh, you're not going to talk about this? No. Okay, so uh, Genomics England, um, I guess about three, four years ago, started thinking about the problem that they had because people were just sending them data to report the phenotypes uh, for the 100,000 genomes project. And Genomics England had to normalize it, right? So it's now reversed where these genomic medical centers, GMCs, are normalizing data from trusts, putting it in the same format, uh, and then sending it off. So this creates a lot of opportunity for these hospitals to share this data, not just with Genomics England, but among <coughs> themselves. And now, uh, just recently, uh, uh, Midlands, West Midlands, has joined. So now we have about 25, 30 hospitals uh, doing this type of reporting using archetypes. Um, and the last one is 
uh, a really interesting project in Germany uh, called HiMed, which is trying to build a platform architecture to collaborate at the data level, the research between the big German hospitals. And why this is interesting is because if you know anything about Germany, you know they don't share anything among the hospitals. Uh, they're actually really paranoid about privacy. They don't have a, even a single identifier for the country. Uh, there's 250 insurance companies. <coughs> Each has their own insurance card. It's basically a mess. So these centers, uh, and uh, they're quite large ones. It's uh, Heidelberg, Göttingen, Hanover, and the, uh, the German uh, uh, Cancer um, uh, Institute or the Cancer Registry uh, got together and said, look, we need to normalize data and we need to agree on the same format among all the players, do the normalization in-house, and then we can allow for research queries to go across. They will keep data on site, but they will allow research type of queries to go across. And actually, uh, they've chosen IHE for the infrastructure, OpenEHR for structured data, FHIR for the interfacing, and SNOMED CT for the terminology, core terminology. And this is what we are seeing now in most projects around the world. Basically, if, if you had to choose the four, I think these would, be, these would be pretty much what people are looking at at the moment. Okay? Um, and actually, they, they use this architecture. Uh, but it fits very well with what they're, what they're doing. And once they've normalized uh, the data, they were thinking first about the de-identified data for research. But they realized that actually it's the same data. So now they have two instances. One is the normal identified one, then the de-identified one. And on the identified one, they're now producing applications for the trust to use internally. Because the data has already been, uh, I mean, it's being normalized. So it actually makes it quite easy to do applications on top. And not only that, these four, and now two more are joining, will be able to share these applications amongst themselves. Um, cancer registry type of uh, tumor boards, things like that. So um, what they, they talk about something called a knowledge-based uh, systems architecture, but it means basically a combination of well-structured data plus terminologies. And finally, we're talking about ecosystems. So once you have normalized the data, it actually makes sense to use the normalized data through APIs and invite others to help you build applications. And this is what I understand Plymouth is, is doing right now. So Salford is another example of this. Uh, they're running um, um, a monolithic EHR. Uh, they try to develop apps on top of that through APIs. They found that getting data out was OK, but putting new data in was next to impossible. Because you have to realize that even with open e APIs, the vendors still have proprietary data models underneath. And somebody has to do this mapping. And of course, it has to be the vendor. So when you try to introduce new data into such systems, you have to go back to the vendor. They have to produce a new version. It's a release cycle. And it was just killing the project. So they've decided to take, start taking data out, putting it into an open platform, and invite the local community of developers to build applications. Medtronic is an, an interesting one as well because they have a lot of data and uh, they're basically a device company. They need to move into software, value-based care even, meaning that they have to prove their solution works and they need data for that. So despite the fact that their devices produce different types of data, they are now starting to normalize this data for outcomes reporting, for providing feedback to their customers on how they are improving care, which is actually part of their contractual obligations. So to summarize, um, I think we all in this room understand that healthcare is really changing and that today's monolithic applications can't cope. Uh, I showed an example from another industry where this has already happened, the ERP industry, and I firmly believe that the same thing will happen in healthcare. Uh, this also means that the future is multi-vendor and that in a multi-vendor world, of course, you have to have vendor neutral data. You cannot have a single <coughs> vendor monopolize the data. And through the examples of today, I hope you will see that uh, OpenEHR provides a proven platform on top of which you can build these new innovative applications. So thank you.
Thank you, Tomas. Um, I've almost have seen this presentation now three, four, five and times. And you learned something new? Absolutely. Oh. It's, a, it's as insightful today as it was the very first time. And the more I see it, the more I, I see you thinking, isn't this common sense? Yes. I can, yes. It is, isn't it? it, it you just oh, look at it and think, this so is... So I should stop doing you, this? You <laughs> should just say, this is common <laughs> sense. Yeah. You need to talk to the right people. That's the trouble. Yeah. We can take one very, very quick question. We're running a bit over, but if you've got one quick question. There we go. Hi, uh, John Seth, the Chief Executive uh, Insignior. Um, excellent presentation. Um, you spoke, we spoke this morning around uh, the difference between perhaps an open platform and open software. Uh -huh. uh, Miranda has both. You've got your open platform, you've got your open EP. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, and in the context of uh, not a single vendor being the owner of innovation, I was wondering what your plans were for open EP, and particularly if and how you plan on engaging the open source community uh, around that. Well, again, the, the open EP is basically, um, the idea for OpenEP came because, as I've shown you before, we have a full EHR in, in, in Slovenia. We, had, we just understood we're too small to compete against big vendors for the full EHR. So we decided to focus on something that is um, basically high-end, but can be used uh, standalone if you integrate it properly. And when we came actually to, to Peter and the NHS, we asked, what is the missing piece in the NHS? And at that time, it was like, three, four years ago, they said, oh, e-prescribing. You know, 70% of trusts don't have e-prescribing. So that's why we decided to carve out this piece. And of course, it took us some time to adapt it to the UK market. So we see that as a standalone product. Of course, the added advantage is that it works off the same infrastructure. And it comes embedded with, with the platform. So we definitely see this going forward as a, as a separate product. Now, we're now in discussions on, is there another product that we need to do to jumpstart this market? But our core is building infrastructure, okay? But in terms of collaborative development of OpenEP, in whichever direction it goes as an open source project, is, is that something that around is interested? It is, but you have to be careful here because, you know, and, and this, is, this is something that uh, we can discuss uh, uh, in, the, in the afternoon in the workshops. Uh, there has to be a body that takes uh, things like safety cases and things like that and actually it's a big effort to uh, safety assure an application where many companies are working on. So we're trying to more or less make it a med platform, meaning that it would be able to add plugins for certain decision support stuff and stuff like that. Um, the core, I'm not sure. I mean, you can take it and, and, and run with it. That's not the problem. The code is there. It's just that it, there has to be enough money for somebody to manage the thing as a whole and quality assure this for customers like Plymouth uh, because this is very serious software. You know, this uh, software can kill people if it's, if it's buggy. We'll probably pick this up in a couple of This is workshops. not a small app. That's what I'm trying to say. You know, that's, that's another world. Uh, so... Um, we need to find a mechanism to do that, but we're willing to do it. Why not? Absolutely. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you.